hours later. I, I, it was a literal hour. We spent. I just spent a little. Uh, lit, that is a face. Literal hour, trying to. Uh, that is a different face. Are you ready? Finally. Yeah, I don't know. I'm good. Ready. You've been sitting here watching me. I was finding movies on my own. I was. Oh yeah. Occupying myself. Do you have an episode for us? I do. We? Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Two Weird Didn't Watch. I know you thought we died or gave up. We didn't. For some reason, we didn't give up. Apparently, we're back. Actually, this is the first time I've seen you since the COVID. Longer. Look, if I say I haven't seen you since the COVID, it, it doesn't mean I saw you the day <laughs> the COVID started, and then I hadn't seen you since then. I'm just saying, like in that whole span of time, plus however much I haven't right. seen you. Was that an intro? I don't know. We talk about movies we have not seen based on nothing but the word descriptions. He did not say that. <laughs> Brantley's kicking things off for us today. <laughs> Brantley, what do you got? We're going to talk about movies by Laurie Brewster. Laurie, Law, Laurie? L-A-W-R-I-E. He's Scottish. It's a, Okay, so it's a dude. It's not a girl named yeah. Laurie. Laurie? Lowry. I'm going to say Lowry. And he works at a brewery. Yep. All right, hit me. His first movie is Lord of Tears from 2013. Oh, is this going to be artsy? Yeah, he tries. I've seen the trailers. Lord of Tears sounds like, you know, about an hour's worth at least of somebody in a room, you know, sending emails to their ex-girlfriends. It's not that. Having ennui. There's probably some ennui. Uh, uh, this one, this we're, we're doing three movies for him. This first one's pretty long. Can we, I just gotta say, can we stop doing movies with ennui? Surely at this point everybody understands that somebody could have a real problem besides i'm kind of bored you guys so we're setting up for haunting of some kind mm -hmm. he gets explicit directions from his dead mom not to go in this place i wish i could say i'm surprised this is the you inherited a mystery house don't visit that everybody has to visit i mean if i got a letter from a dead person saying don't go in the house I would at least consider going in the I'm house. I'm beelining straight to the house. I'm going to take other people with me. I might not live there like he plans to do. Yeah. The, the, the moving in is the part that's weird to me. Like, okay, you go there. I get that. You move in. It might be like he's now responsible for the house, so he has to pay like property taxes, so he has to like sell his old like apartment or whatever. Oh, maybe. Or, like, leave. I've always thought like mansions would be a lot of work to yeah. put up with. They're giant houses, like. The, the the only movie that I've ever seen that addressed that, and I'm not saying it's the only movie ever, but um, Guillermo del Toro's Crimson Peak did a great job of talking about, like, what it was like to be a poor lord. Yeah. Where <laughs> you have all this land and the title, and yet you have no money to <laughs> deal with the fact that you have all this land. That you're trying, you, you're expected to keep up, and there's people who are, you know, your tenants, but you're actually supposed to have responsibility to them too. Uh, it's sort of a two-way street, and if you're not keeping your end of the bargain up, you know, they're not going to keep paying you their rent, or at least they're not going to be happy about it. All right. Anyway, continue. Soon after he arrives, he meets the beautiful American Eve, who lives nearby in a set of renovated stables. Okay, so his mom, in addition to saying. The evil house haunted. Don't go in. Also, setting up a little Airbnb business on the side with their horse stables. Apparently. He also finds evidence that he had a mental breakdown as a child, brought about by visions of a creature known as the Owl Man. Okay. Which is an actual thing from Cornish mythology. You just picture, like, the Mothman, only more owly. I People have kind of described the Mothman as kind of owly. In fact, I was mm -hmm. going to make that connection yeah he came after um if you google alaman you will get the dc supervillain by the way there he is <laughs> oh man Put, yeah type I'll... encrypted behind that <laughs> hold on we're typing <laughs> we got the there you go that's a yeah. cool cryptid right it's, there it's basically just the moth man he's literally yeah it's the same guy yeah the, uh, thing, the theory whatever. is that it was seen in like a bell tower and the theory is that it was just an eagle owl that would, a guy saw while he was drunk people trying to describe like the cryptid doesn't have to be real, mm -hmm. but neither does it have to be like, here is the definite explanation for how this people became to believe in this monster. Like there's a lot of 
sort of subconscious weirdness going on with people. If you just boil it down to one guy saw something one time. Huh. Okay. So this is pretty typical, sort of the ancestral pagan magic. What was the one we did where the house start or the movie starts with a house burning down? I don't remember the name of the movie. I actually ended up watching like part of that movie and it was okay. But it was, you know, sort of everybody's doing devil worship and then it comes back to bite them but the kids can't stay away and you know they go back to the house did we cover that one what did we cover that one we did yes i don't remember it (laughs) it's okay (laughs) the topic of today's episode is amnesia memory is fallible highly that's why you need evidence of court he eventually begins to recall more from his past even as the owl man's present begins to grow increasingly ominous culminating in James discovering that his parents had been worshipping worshipping Moloch, who would grant wishes in exchange for a sacrifice. Isn't Chimosh also a baby bar- worshipping killing god? There's probably a few of those. I'm googling Molech. Molech was like a like a bold god. We've talked about bold gods in the past on this uh, show, so I don't want to go too much into that. But I'm wondering where they got the owl man from Molech. I'm just Googling Chimosh now. Oh, Chimosh is just a dude. Sometimes with four arms. Sometimes with four arms, but yeah. And by that I mean two sets of arms, not, not <laughs> that he sometimes has lower parts of his arms. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they've broken off. Statues are old, man. They fall apart. Yeah, okay. I'll accept that, though. You, you gotta You gotta work with what yeah. you got. This causes James to regain his lost memories, discovering that Moloch had been manifesting himself as the Owl Man, and that he was supposed to be the sacrifice that he demanded. Right. Pr- it's a baby sacrifice. Pretty yeah. typical stuff. His parents were unwilling to offer James, so they took in an orphaned American girl as a nanny and murdered her in James' stead, claiming that as they had been her guardians, she was a reasonable substitute. They tried to scam a god. <laughs> I gotta say, though, it's interesting to see sort of people... Usually when you have these types of movies and they're pe- like the, the cultist parents are into the demon worship mm-hmm. and the God says, give me your son or whatever. They don't, they don't hesitate. It's like, this is what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're a hundred percent down. You know with what we it. signed up for. These parents are like, Whoa, we got in a little deeper than we were <laughs> expecting to on this. Um, is there any, like, loopholes or bylaws or, like... My favorite one of those is from the show Reaper. Have you ever watched it? Reaper, no. Okay, so the backstory is the main character's soul was sold to the devil before he was born. Okay. Um, the dad got sick, and the devil's like, okay, I can cure you, but firstborn child. They're like, okay, no babies. Um, um, so they just decide not to have kids, and they go to a fertility clinic, and they're told that the dad is infertile. The guy who told them this was the devil in disguise. <laughs> Okay. And that is hilarious. <laughs> yep, he'll get you like that. <laughs> James then realizes that this girl was Eve, which causes Eve to remember the events as well and turn into a menacing figure intent on driving James insane via a series of attacks. Okay, this twist is, um... She's a ghost. Who's living in the stables, apparently. Wait, so she turned from, like, a little American kid into well, a she was American a, babe? Well, she was an American... As a ghost? Uh, she was hired as a nanny, so I'm guessing like 15, 16. So, oh, okay. And I guess maybe ghost age? Yeah, well, that's that's what I was going to ask about. I didn't... I, w- I wasn't aware that ghosts had aging things happening going I on. I mean, ghosts all have different wor- rules and different mythologies, so who knows? I gotta say, one of my favorite ghost mythologies that I've read recently, anyway, was in the book Jerusalem by Alan Moore. Which has these ghosts that are kind of like reliving their lives, mm-hmm. but also overlaid onto the like modern day. So there's like layers of time they can pass through. Hmm. And so they'll be walking through, you know, modern traffic, but then also interacting with like their memories of their former selves. All right, right. Sort of like time is all, all of time is happening at the same time, essentially. Um, it just depends on how they interact with it. Really neat idea. Hmm. They don't age. Well, most ghosts tend not to, unless they, they just rot with their bodies like because in uh, the Frighteners. it's difficult, what with being dead and stuff. <laughs> he tries to flee from the house, but finds that Moloch will not allow him to leave. 
Molly claims to have no will, ill will against James. Rather, his anger is directed at his now deceased parents. He tells James that only fighting Eve's bones and putting them to rest will end the haunting and free him. Molly seems like, for a god who wants a baby sacrifice, sacrifice he seems pretty reasonable. I'm trying to figure out... Also, Chimosh... Man, why didn't you guys go with Chimosh? Apparently he's associated with owls. Is he from... Is he... He's a dude, but he has, like, owl sidekicks. Yeah, but where, where is he from? Because this, this is, like, in Cornish areas. I don't know. I'm England. on... Pin- I, here's what it is. I have a, a picture pulled up from Pinterest. Yep, I see that. The owl as an archetype exists throughout many cultures, but the owl has direct links to the worship of Ishtar, the Queen of Heaven. Ooh, Shimash was a, was a god. Or you could have gone with Ishtar as well, and then you could have had some lady god stuff going on. Yeah, but dude gods are scarier. Chimosh was a god developed out of the primitive Semitic mother goddess, Athtar, whose name he bears. The etymology of Chimosh is unknown. If he doesn't... Okay, hunt forever. So, so, not Chimosh. Molech. Is it Molech? Molech. I'm going to say Molech. Molech wanted a sacrifice from his parents. Yeah, he made a deal for a fortune. It's like, okay, give me a baby. Give me a baby. They're like, hey, how about not a baby... But Baby's Nanny instead. Who we technically are the caretakers of, so loophole. But then they didn't follow through and give her the, like... They did the sacrifice, but apparently he's like, no loopholes. But why does he want her bones then? What's he going to do with her bones anyway? He didn't want her in the first place. (laughs) James is able to find Eve's bones and puts them to rest in the front yard. Her soul free, Eve leaves the grounds as a heartbroken James begs her not to go. James what did he want to do? She's a ghost. Yeah, but he fell in love with her. But, she, like, <laughs> is she corporeal in any sense? Because... I mean, I'm assuming it is because he didn't catch on that she's a ghost for a while. So she could just, like, pick stuff up and move it around? I mean, she apparently didn't know she was a ghost, so yes. <laughs> well, she could have been, you know, filling all that stuff in mentally. Yeah, that's fair. You know, just, again, like in, we're uh, talking about forgetting sense. things being an important theme here. <laughs> You know, if, if you just didn't notice that you weren't picking things up. James visits his friend Alan and tells a story, horrified that his parents made such a monstrous choice, and states that he would not have done the same. Look, I know my parents are down with the sacrifice. Me, not not not, not down with that. Don't, don't worry. Oh, Alan. I thought he was saying, like, no, I definitely would have sacrificed my kid. I don't know why. <laughs> Standing up, James feels woozy. He realizes that Alan has poisoned him and plans to kill him using the ritual sacrifice to appease Moloch. Alan begs for James to forgive him, even as he is killing him, explaining that Moloch came to him and offered to save his father, who was dying of disease, if he completed the sacrifice. Okay. The film ends at back at uh, back of the mansion, where a light suddenly c- turns on the catacombs, and a new skull rests in the ceremonial, ceremonial fashion, hinting that James' ghost has now taken the place of Eve's, and will remain there until another sacrifice is performed. So what I'm saying is this movie is a downer. <laughs> yes. But... It's also confusing. Yes. <laughs> because it's not exactly clear to me what Molech is after. He wanted the sacrifice he asked for. And he's going to get it. But they have this idea of we're going to just like have a progress of sacrifices also. So Eve was one of the sacrifices and now but James is. he's not the one is... he asked for. He asked for James. And he like now James is going to help him get somebody else? No, it's Alan. Alan he promises Alan, who lives in the same town... That I'll cure your sick dad if you kill this guy who was supposed to be killed for me anyways a couple years ago. Also, Alan comes out of nowhere here. He was mentioned earlier, but... Oh, was he? I... In the version I took down, it shifted all of him down to the bottom. Okay. He's like, tells the story. He's like, hey, my you know, my mom died and I'm going to here to get her stuff. And he's like, my dad's dying. That's basically what's in the other description. All right, so that is it for that one. Like okay. I said, it was fairly long. Now, this is the next one is going to be a movie from the same director? Same director. All right. This is The Unkindness of Ravens from 2016. You got to give him those artsy fartsy titles, man. He is. I mean, Unkindness, going for it. Unkindness is a, another term for a group of ravens. Oh, I get. I, yeah. I mean, I could figure that out, but it's not like the. The Owl Man. The Owl Man. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like Walmart DVD shelf. Rules say Would you have need had the to owl say animal. what it has in it and then have a picture of it. And he's like, no, we will have it called the unkindness of ravens instead of like raven flock murderers or something. <laughs> Andrew, 
is a homeless war veteran that has been experiencing terrifying flashbacks of his time in the army. Oh. Flashbacks that contain visions of imposing raven-like creatures. Which, basically same makeup as the Owlman, only with a raven head. Are you, for real? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can look it up if you want. <laughs> it doesn't uh, yeah, do I will, for the actually. Podcast. <laughs> oh, there's an episode of One Tree Hill? Of course there is. Called... Put in 2016. <laughs> None of these. This guy's got. These are relatively of... unknown Scottish he... movies. Oh yeah, I got it. the poster is also quite. That's so insult searching indie cover. It really is. <laughs> so for those of you who are listening at home, it's a dude on a beach. The most boring dude. No, it's not a beach. It's like a heath. Oh okay. The most boring dude you can imagine. He's wearing multiple shades of brown. He's like a brown dude. Oh, he is homeless. Okay, fair enough. He, he is a, nice a white dude. He is not a brown dude. I want to be clear. Yes, he's wearing. He's holding a digital camera, and that's it. It's, he's just standing blankly in front of an almost the most boring background you could think of, and then against a gray sky in white letters that you almost can't see, the title "The Unkindness of Ravens" is written out in like gothic font. <laughs> You can't say these guys aren't trying for something. Yeah. These flashbacks are so intimidating that Andrew has developed a phobia of ravens, and as a result, he travels to a retreat in the Scottish Highlands to come to terms with his past and his fears. Okay. How, however, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, however, he soon discovers that this is easier said than done, as this move will bring him face to face with the supernatural force known only as the Raven Warriors. Which is what this movie would be called if it was made in America. Yeah, exactly. What <laughs> What is wrong with you? You have the Raven Warriors in your movie and you don't call it the Raven Warriors? Nope, you call it an unkindness of, or the unkindness of ravens. You have these super cool, like, plague doctor raven looking things in your movie and the poster isn't that. It's boring dude on boring heath. Oh, it makes me so mad. It's like this guy <laughs> is ashamed of what he's making. He's like, oh, man, I really want to make genre films, but... I also want to make money. No, <laughs> I don't think... I think he would make more money if he was like, I'm I'm, abs- I'm going to sell out. I'll okay. just... Like, I'll have a, a raven thing that's not even in there, and he's going to have a sword, even though there's no sword in the movie. And So the asylum style. Exactly. Just like... <laughs> Put a big tentacle some... monster in your movie about chicken leg dinosaur monsters. It looks like... So I'm only looking at one still here, also, mm-hmm. from the movie. But it looks like a good still. It doesn't look like, you know, crap. Yeah, these are... It's lit. Fairly interesting trailers, which I have watched the trailers for these first two. It's well lit. It's well composed. Uh, I'm I'm curious what's going on. I have to say this one reminds me of a short story that I read a while back. Uh, it's also the, the the title of the short story is the title of the short story collection that you can find it in. It's very good. It's called The Wide Carnivorous Sky, mm-hmm. and it's about this guy who it's it's about essentially about PTSD, but in like. You know, this is genre fiction, so instead of just PTSD, the guy ha- has dealt with a vampire that would, like, drop into battle zones from orbit and, like, tear up, you know, whole swaths of people around him and then, like, go back up into space. Huh. So it's one of those things where, like, anytime he's outside, he's just, like, constantly looking up thinking about where's this thing at and eventually they bait it in and try to kill it but uh it's really well written the guy i think john langdon is the name of the uh author and he has many good stories in that collection including a great zombie story that's told with like a cool framing device that the it's a short story talking about a play being put on about zombies but then the zombies are actually part of the play as well as it's, they're good stories. I don't know <laughs> if it ha- if it's any way similar, but it reminded me of that a lot. Is that everything for the unkindness of that Ravens? That is everything for the kind of unkindness of Ravens. Yes, I gotta see that movie. Up I... next, the third one for this, we have the Black Gloves. The Black Gloves. Yes, from 2017, okay. next year. 
So he's putting down a movie a year. Uh, between these two, yes. Uh, the you know the Owlman movie, whatever. Uh, Lord of Tears was in 2013, so he did take a four year break between these movies. Then. Okay. I think he was like doing other things for other people. Maybe he's being a prop guy. Finn Galloway is a psychologist that has become obsessed with one of his patients, which is never a good sign. Yeah, that's not so good. A young woman who had been terrified of a sinister owl-headed entity called Man, the Owl Man. Man, this guy's really getting his use out of this costume, isn't yeah. he? Mm-hmm. It's a cool costume. It really is. I, I, I get you. I understand where you're coming from, but... To those who aren't in a place where you can Google it, it is basically a dude in a like an old-timey suit... With it's long a Slenderman talons. kind of, but yeah. if you replaced all of his slendery weird bits with owl bits. Yeah, he's got like long talon, like owl talons for hands, and he's got a big owl head. But he's got a suit, yeah, like yeah. Brantley said, he's got a single button suit with a white. It kind of has tails shirt. behind it, yeah. Uh, it's a it's a striking look. I don't know if it's Two three movies. different movies with v- minor alterations. Uh, the second striking. one was owl people, or with raven people, so it's a different look. Yeah, I, you know what? The Raven people didn't didn't have the suit either. Yeah. So, and this this had... one I believe is a like kind of sequel to the first one, like in same universe. I don't know if the Raven people are. Okay. Uh, do, 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 if it's do. a if it's a sequel, if this is like a side sequel or like another thing that takes place with the same Moloch. stuff, yeah, yeah Molek, then I'm then I'm actually okay with it. His investigations bear little fruit until he learns of a former ballerina named Elisa Gray who has sequestered herself at the Baldurak estate with only her guardian, Lorena Vales of Alaska, for company. Finn discovers that Eliza does suffers from identical fears, which prompts him to begin treating her in hopes of uncovering the truth, only to find this will likely bring him face-to-face with the terrifying Owl Man. Okay, so, this dude has the hots for his patient. Now he's obsessed, doesn't... Am, it might be that, but I think it's more he's obsessed with her psychosis okay then so she's telling him about owl man things Mm -hmm. he doesn't see owl man for a while yeah but then he just randomly goes on a trip well he hears about elisa gray who has similar fears of an owl man entity okay probably from one of his peers mentions this patient that he is really into her delusions oh like he's at a cocktail party or something but i say good man owl man (laughs) I don't know why I'm doing kind of an English accent when it's clearly Scotland that all these movies take place in. Because do you want to attempt in a Scottish accent? No, I really wasn't. Okay. And I'm not going to. I want to see this now. I want to see all these movies. Like the, I, Again, I haven't seen the trailer for The Black Love. I do like that poster. It's a great poster. The it's poster, much better than the other one. Yeah, it has like... It's hand painted. It, has it the, looks like something from the 40s except for the Owl Man back there. Even the Owl Man could have been from that time. I, yeah. they, I think the only thing that holds it back from being from there is that I don't know that they would have gotten a costume that detailed back then. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Like, the design, basic, yeah, but it's, I guess, too good of a costume for back then, which sounds kind of... I, mean, I don't know why. It just, I don't know why they they weren't that good. It also feels kind of grungier than they he would have been back then, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. grittier, I guess. Would have been a cleaner look. I was, I, I wanted to, you know, you mentioned this guy, and I just, you know, sort of get on, get ready to start making fun of people. But these all seem at least compelling enough in description form mm-hmm. that I would be interested in checking out what he's doing. And especially having looked at these uh, still images from the films, it, it looks like he's not just phoning it in. So that's nice. I do. His, uh, the viral marketing I was talking about is on YouTube, so you can watch where he's just spooking people with a costume. And seeing it in motion, the costume kind of holds up, especially if you're, you know, when you see people who aren't expecting it. I believe that. Around a corner, and there's an owl man walking towards them menacingly, and they just panic and run away. What are the odds that movie three is connected at all to movie one? It uses the same costume, and it's based on the Owl Man. I honestly do not know. The description I had was remarkably shorter than the first one. Right. And I don't know. Okay. Oh, it's a, this one's in black and white. Ooh. And that's all that he's made so far? Uh, that's all that's come up. Uh, double check. Short a movie called Whiteout. 
This does not seem like the same guy. Mm -hmm. No, same dude. Yeah. Are you ready for some whiplash, Brantley? Yeah, always. <laughs> okay. Bring it on, written by Anonymous. So we, uh, we, we've, we've uncovered an early Lori Brewster offering. Two years before. When he was slumming in the, the depths of genre fiction before he got his artsiness going. Whiteout from 2011. It's summer, 2011. And much of the world is in the icy grasp of a seemingly endless winter. It's Ragnarok. Yeah, I, I, it would be cool if it was tied in with some gods or, yeah. like, if, if Molech or Chimash came up. No, I, I'm the one who brought up Chimash. He's probably not going to come up here. Unemployed web designer. Those are three words you love to hear all together when the protagonist of your movie. Mm-hmm. He's not even really a web designer. He's uh, he's just played around a little bit on um, WordPress. Oh, okay, WordPress works. <laughs> sure. Unemployed web designer John Hansen is conscripted by the health service to report on how the people of a small Scottish town are coping are coping with the worsening conditions. Because that's the job of a web designer. Web yeah, designer, I'm reporter, same thing. I'm trying to get a grasp on how endless this winter has seemed. Like, is it just kind of late May and Well, it is it's summer 2011. Okay, fair enough. So, it, it hasn't been... When they say seemingly endless, so they're meaning... at least in June. It yeah, has like gone on like 50 from the previous year, yeah. not like it's been a 50-year winter or something. I'm assuming. It doesn't seem like that's far enough along for them to be tagging unemployed web designers to yeah. go and check on Scottish towns. He's really good at web design. <laughs> <laughs> the economy crashed, so nobody needed a website, but he's actually really legit. Yeah. Um, like, okay, he's now the best, get there but it's so cold, and make an amazing website telling us how they're doing. <laughs> Small Scottish town is doing fine.com has already been registered. <laughs> so here's the worsening conditions they're dealing with. Freezing temperatures, rising food prices... And oil shortages. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm all fine with that. As so it's hard to get, and you're going to be running generators for heat, so yeah. Yeah, I don't know if the winter is, like, snowy. There's going to be delivery problems as well. Mm -hmm. So in addition to everything that's And then just... you're paying the oil and gas to truck things in or fly things and in. And you're using more if you have, like, heating oil. Mm -hmm. All that stuff. And even if you aren't, like, the world is. Yeah. As infrastructure and government crumble... An illness spreads, taking civilization as we know it to the brink. Wow, fiction from 2011, huh? Yeah. Boy. I was uh, going to not say anything. Oil prices are going down for us, though, so you know, take yeah, that. Yeah, that's actually, we are not in an endless winter. It is quite warm now. Yeah, it's, it was 93 degrees when I got here. I'm getting hotter. Faced with this collapse, John is forced to reflect on his inability to confront and commit to life's challenges. What? Th mm -hmm. He's committed to being a web designer. I mean, here's the thing. I have a problem with this. I have a major problem with this. Huh? The type of... I mean, we started off today talking about ennui mm -hmm. and how I'm sick and done with ennui. And the reason I'm done with it is because... When you end up facing an actual real challenge, it kind of dissipates. Like, if you're fighting for your life, the one thing you're not thinking about is, well, what does it all mean? What do, why am I here, really? And like, no, you're just like, I'm dealing with stuff right now. I don't have time for that kind of nonsense. He's clearly actually rising to a challenge, but he's still stuck in this sort of indie film... Ooda loop of well, but what do I do with with my life? You're doing what you're gonna do with your life. Check on small Scottish towns. Yeah, like you're helping out at least a little bit. There's things going to crap all around you. There's all kind of opportunities for you to help out. It can't be possible for you to just be sitting there. In fairness, he was conscripted. He was forced into doing this. Even that's even I would say even more so though. Not like he chose, but like now he's just he's got something to do. I. This does not ring true to me, based on my life experiences. Uh, maybe I'm way off base. 
But I didn't finish the sentence. He reflects on his inability to commit and uh, confront to life's change. Commit. <laughs> confront and commit. Yes. And on whether now, in this perilous new world, he can change to protect the ones he loves. Are they also in the Scottish town? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's like a journey back. Yeah. Maybe he's sitting there in the Scottish town having I mean, his own way thinking cool about it. cool image of a helicopter. Do you think they have a helicopter in this movie? Yeah. See, this is what I'm weirded out by because this movie has the asylum cover and name. Tell us something. When did The Day After Tomorrow come out? Way before this. Okay. I'm looking at 2004. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, way before... But it is that kind of thing. It's like low budget movie, kind of based on Day After Tomorrow. It's got on the cover. There isn't a small Scottish town. It's like Parliament, yeah, with you know helicopters with guys hanging off of them and the you know the ice coming up over everything. It has thriller based on the conspiracy theories of Michael C. Rupert. Who is Michael C. Rupert, Al? I don't know, but I did you know The Day After Tomorrow was based on a book as well? I did not. It was based on a book called The Coming Global Superstorm. Day After Tomorrow is a better title. Still not a great title, but it's a better title. But uh, Do you know who co-wrote The Coming Global Superstorm? No. Art Bell. Oh. Art Bell's an overnight uh, talk radio host that mm-hmm. died several years back, but when I was... Uh, he has a cameo in the Prey video game. <laughs> I was delivering papers... Uh, in my youth, I would listen to his uh, show, Coast to Coast AM. And when Day After Tomorrow was coming out, he was talking about it nonstop, like, based on my book, <laughs> The Coming Global Superstore. It's not really, not act, it's just a dumb thriller, but sure, Art. He is, as himself in the movie Prey, doing his radio show. And he gets more and more annoyed when people keep calling him about the actual supernatural and alien events. He's like, guys, stop trolling my show. <laughs> Art Bell is legit. He, he like, he My would, he believed kind of and interrogated into the supernatural stuff, but he also would do stuff like that. He would just call people out on their nonsense and be like, nah, that's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like one guy's like, um, My daughter, her eyes were glowing yellow. I looked her in the room. I'm really scared. Her. He goes, Okay, I think this guy's having a little fun with those guys and just like hangs up on him. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're fighting ghosts on a spaceship hearing this. <laughs> that game is nuts. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, tell a friend about us. Subscribe to us if you want to... S- I was going to say see more, but there's nothing to see. Hear more of these. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys. Bye.